So I was a student at MIT, and I was scheduled on the wonderful scholarship program <clears throat> supported by MIT Lincoln Labs to get a master's degree. And it was a very rigid schedule. You're going to be done in two years, get a job at Lincoln Lab, and do research. And so I was on the program, and I was one of the few people who actually finished on time. And as I was finishing, I scheduled to have my first child the summer of 1958 when it was going to be done. In that summer, my professor at the Surfer Mechanisms Lab at MIT said, you have to get a PhD. I said, I don't want to get a PhD. I've done this program. I'm scheduled. My child has just been born. So you got to do it. So he kept twisting my arm. And finally I said, OK, I'll do it. But I'm going to do it. I want to work on something that's really significant and not piddle around for the next three or four years. So I decided I'm going to work for the best professor I know at MIT, and that was Claude Shannon. Okay the infamous, wonderful, magnificent person, Claude Channing. So I called him up, and he invited me to his house, and we chatted a bit, decided, yes, we're going to work together. First thing I started working on, actually, was a chess playing program. Just working with a man was a delight. The, 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 he was a great engineer, great mathematician, smart as heck, could solve a problem like that. And I looked around at my classmates, most of whom were working for him, and most of them were working on the kind of work he had developed, namely the field of information theory and coding theory. And I looked at them, and I had taken those courses, and I said, you know, the work that they're doing is the work that he left behind. Those problems that are left over are hard and probably not of great significance, little bits and pieces left. And I said, that's not what I signed up for. I wanted something that would be fun, exciting, challenging, and have impact. Meanwhile, being at MIT and Lincoln Laboratory, I was surrounded by computers. And I recognized, you know, one day these computers are going to have to talk to each other. Because this is way early. There were, nobody was thinking about that at the time. But I said, if they're going to talk to each other, what technology would support their communication and the interaction? And the answer is there was nothing available. So I had an approach. I figured the way to provide the communications would be to provide the ability for shared communication links. Because I knew that computers, when they talk, they don't talk the way I am now continuously. They go blast, and they're quiet for a while. A little while later, they suddenly come up and blast again. And you can't afford to dedicate a communications connection for something which is almost never talking. But when I want to talk, I want immediate access. So we had to not use the telephone network, which is designed for continuous talking, the circuit switch network, but something else. And I had an approach using some mathematical thinking, namely queuing theory. There was a model I could develop. And it just made sense to do that which we had done in time sharing. In time sharing, you have a big computer, and a lot of people share it. When you're using it, I'm not. When you're not, I am. So we sort of interlace each other. Why not use communications the same way? We're going to set up communications capability, let everybody jump in and share it, and they only get to use it when they have something to send. This is a new technology. I said, well, there's an approach. I have a mathematical tool to do it. It's clearly important. It will have impact. And nobody's looked at this yet, so there's a lot of low-hanging fruit around. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. <laughs> so it's perfect for me. So I, I started working on that problem. Now, this was years before anybody needed this technology. In time sharing, for example, which is the underlying technology that I adapted to communications, in time sharing, you want to let the little jobs go before the big jobs. Yeah. Because why, why should a little guy wait a long time for a big job? He's just going to get in and get out. So when jobs come in, you ask them, how long are you? And they're all going to say, I'm tiny. So you say, OK, you're tiny. I'll give you a little bit of time. And if you're tiny, you'll be out of there. No, I'll send you to the back of the queue, and you get another tiny shot. The notion of round robin. So you get a little bit at a time. We're going to break you into little chunks. You get a chunk at a time. I said, that's a great idea for sharing communications. We'll give everybody a little bit of communications time. The little ones will filter out. The short jobs will filter out. <clears throat> when I say job, I mean message. A short message will filter out. And the long ones will take a little longer. And they don't mind being interrupted by the little guys. The important thing in this technology was not to make the very short messages wait behind very long messages. This automatic round robin, which is now called packet switching, 
you chop things into fixed lengths, you give them a little bit, if not, that's not enough, give them another piece, and they go fly into the network on their own. So the idea of packetizing was important, the idea of distributed control, the idea of large shared systems in which you get some terrific design benefits came along. And so this got published, McGraw Hill book, nobody cared. I got went, published early? Yeah, this, this right was away. published, my dissertation ended in December 62, I graduated in June 63, this book was published in 1964. And nobody cared? Nobody cared. In fact, I went to AT&T, the biggest network of the time, and I explained to them, you guys ought to give us good data communications. And their answer was, what are you talking about? The United States is a copper mine, it's full of telephone wires, use that. <laughs> and I said, no, no, you don't understand. It takes you 35 seconds to set up a call, you charge me a minimum of three minutes, and I want to send 100 milliseconds of data. And their answer was, little boy, go away. <laughs> so little boy went away and with others developed this technology which ate their lunch. But nobody cared, and they said it wouldn't work. And even if it did work, they want nothing to do with it. So that was the environment we faced. It wasn't until years later when the government decided they needed a network that suddenly I saw a way in which I could implement the technology I had. But getting back to what I said earlier, I set up this mathematical model. It was analytically intractable, and still is, by the way. It had two choices. One is give up and find something else, or two, make an assumption which allows me to move forward. So I introduced a mathematical assumption which cracked the problem wide open. From that point, I could just sail through the solution, get the, get the performance behavior, get the design principles going forward. But then the question is, was that assumption any good? What was the assumption? The assumption was what I call the independence assumption, and it's absolutely a false assumption. Oh. <laughs> it says when a message travels through the network, it changes its length independently every time it hits a new node on its hop through the network. Right. Mathematically, that, that creates an independence which allows you to proceed with the analysis. But it's clearly not true. Right. So what I had to do was to simulate a network with and without the assumption. I simulated many networks on a machine at Lincoln Laboratory on the TX2 transistorized computer there. And I spent four months writing the simulation program without debugging a single line of it, at a 2,500 line assembly language simulation. And I knew if I didn't get that simulation right, I would get no dissertation. Right. Ran it, tested with and without the assumption, and the results were amazingly close. So I had my solution, I could prove it would work, the package wouldn't fall on the floor, I could tell when things would work well and when they wouldn't. Got published, again, still nobody cared about it. As I said, Lincoln Laboratory sent me for my master's dissertation. They also sent me for my PhD. So they supported me for years. Wonderful economic, financial, research environment support. And I felt an obligation to work for them. And I was prepared to take a job at Lincoln Laboratory, which is a great institution. And so I went, when I went to work there, the first thing they said is, look, Len, why don't you look outside before you can commit to work here Make sure there's nothing out there that you really would like better. This was a, gen a magnificent part, step on their part. So I took a trip to the West Coast. I went to some of the aerospace companies. I was not interested in a university position at all. Really? But it turns out when I was going up to San Francisco to look at some of the high-tech companies up there, uh, a friend of mine suggested I interview with Berkeley. So I did. I interviewed, I came back, they lost my case, they changed the, uh, the uh, chairman, I never heard from them. But on sabbatical, one of the professors that interviewed me came to MIT, while well, I was just finishing my, my PhD then, and he sees me in the hall and says, Kleinrock, how are you? And he thinks that I'm looking for a PA, a, a, an academic position. So he contacts one of his friends here at UCLA, who then invites me out here, offers me a job, and now I've got a dilemma. Do I want to teach? Do I want to cross the United States, or it's almost like on a wagon train, 3,000 miles away from the East Coast where the world is, family is, for a job paying half that I could earn back at, at, at MIT Lincoln Labs, and try something I've never tried before? So I went to the folks at Lincoln Lab, and I said, look, I've got this offer. It looks attractive. It's a, it's, it's a new challenge. What should I do? And there was a wonderful answer they gave. They said, Len, try it. 
If you don't like it, come back. Wow. Wow, is right. Yeah. Well, I came here in August of 63, 50 years ago, and I'm still here.